You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hi, this is Rebecca from the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. Katie and Nathan wanted me to give you a heads up that they use foul language on this show. So if that's not your thing, or if you have kids in the room, this might not be for you. But if you're looking for a show with less swearing and more tutors, head on over to the Tudor's Dynasty podcast, where we talk to authors and historians about one of the best and most intriguing eras in English history. And with that, I hope you enjoyed this amazing episode about one of my favorite Tudor queens, Jane Seymour, third wife of Henry VIII. Hi, I'm Katie. And this is Nathan. And you're listening to Queens, the podcast about badass women in history. Ho, ho, ho. Merry Christmas, Nathan. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Where's my goddamn apple cider with a little bit of rum in it? I know. Um, it's saying. that time of the year again. Get your eggnog, girl. Ugh. Do you like eggnog? <laughs> no, not really. I, I, don't, I don't care for it. It's a little too thick. <laughs> it is thick. <laughs> I'm going to give me the diabetes. Diabetes. All right. So today. <laughs> All right. So diabetes. So diabetes. <laughs> no, today we're here to talk about. Jane Seymour, Ooh. who was the third wife of King Henry VIII of England. I do want to start with a disclaimer. Yeah, definitely. That, um, if you haven't listened to our two-part series on Catherine of Aragon or our two three-part series on Anne Boleyn, um, it would behoove you to do so before listening to this, unless you're already like a knowledge tutor file. Can you say behoove again? No. That was a one-time thing. <laughs> Damn it. Just because there was a lot of people that, you know, when I first started writing the outline, I, like, was reintroducing them and explaining who they are. And it took up a lot of time. And I was like, well, if you've already listened to those other episodes, you don't need me to tell you who Chapuis or Cromwell are. Like, yeah. so just um, go back and listen to those if you haven't already. Um, or if you're not already, like, a Tudor file and yeah. already know this stuff because yeah. it's, like, secondhand nature to you. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah, if you're already, if you haven't listened to those episodes and you're already familiar with Henry the eighth court then you don't need to go back and listen to them but you should because they're good yeah um, we'd like I, to say so ourselves if i do say so myself <laughs> so yeah jane seymour so nathan what's our jane seymour drink okay so nathan made his own little creation so i looked up like an old-fashioned uh-huh. and i was like i'm not feeling whiskey because nathan's I like old whiskey old-fashioned but... because jane is old-fashioned yeah she's okay. a little bit old-fashioned okay i think she was henry the eighth's old-fashioned wife okay um she she liked we'll get into it she liked yeah. her needlework and her like run in the house so she was very much like the mom with the pearls on yeah. probably vacuum. i can see that totally yeah but so i took an old-fashioned but i made it with vodka and i I want to say I watered it down because we are doing a podcast and, and we have to talk for a while and yeah. you do get thirsty and then you realize that you're drinking alcohol. So yes, yes, yes. So I took a shot of vodka and then I did about a half a shot of blood orange liqueur because, mm. you know, she might have a little blood on her hands. Just, she might. She just, might. Just, just, just a little bit we'll of We'll get blood. to it. <laughs> did that and then... Uh, took a cherry out so the original recipe that i wanted to do was with pomegranate mm-hmm. because of catherine of aragon yeah um because we'll get into that a little bit later she too ties in with catherine she as was well. the lady yeah. in waiting so i wanted to do the pomegranate seeds but god damn it h-e-b i love you so much but you didn't have pomegranate i guess it's not in season h-e-b is a texas grocery store yeah. and we are very big fans h-e-b if you would like to be a sponsor of queen's podcast <laughs> Hit me up. Please reach out. Um, <laughs> slide yeah, so onto my DMs. Slide into our DMs. <laughs> um, oh, cool. Well, let's let's give it a taste. Yes. It's got a little club soda, too, okay. to water it down. Oh, that's nice. All right. So you are you ready to jump into the life of... Let's do it, because this one is kind of a doozy, because it plays off the back of two of our other episodes. Yeah, yeah. It's um, It was really interesting to research her. Whenever um, I posted on Facebook, you know, that this was going to be our next subject, we got a lot of people just being like, oh, how boring. And, <laughs> um, and I mean, she's definitely compared... 
to some of the other women we've covered, less exciting. But I think I think she's so misrepresented in history. I do too. I think a lot of what happened with her was kind of just lost because she just she she, she had a very, very short life. She, yeah, she had and, a very short time in the spotlight. And I don't think a lot of what happened with her was documented. Yeah. So and so maybe that was purposely by Henry VIII. We don't know. Yeah. But let's dive right on in to so, Jane Seymour. Absolutely, Jane was born sometime time around 1508 probably yeah and her family was pretty prominent they, they weren't like dukes or anything but they were minor nobility yeah. you know they had their shit together though her father and then her brothers all worked for high-ranking members in the english court and they were far from poor oh yeah and they were like a really old family like their um family actually came over with william the conqueror oh but at that point they were called saint Mauer was their last name. Okay. I don't know if I'm saying that right. M-A-U-R. So whenever they came over... We're going with it. Yeah. When they came over from France, they were St. Mauer, and just over the generations, it became Seymour. Because nice. that's easier to say. So yeah. guess who she was cousins with? Anne Boleyn was her <laughs> second cousin. So her... Their mothers were first cousins. Yes. So they're like distant second cousins. But everybody in the nobility is fucking cousins. So <laughs> it, they didn't see each other at family reunions or anything. No, like, no, definitely not. Definitely, yeah. definitely, yeah, definitely, yeah. Definitely, yeah. So she grew up on a manor called Wolf Hall. It wasn't like the biggest manor in England, but again, they aren't like these impoverished poor people yeah. living in this. They're still. It was still a pretty cush life. Yeah. By sixteenth century standards. Yeah, she grew up with her siblings, and it appears all of the children were pretty close. And unlike many families of nobility, they didn't really send off their children to go get educated. Like, like a, a different court or like with a different family. They kept them all at home until they were old enough to... I think her brother went and started his service at court when he was like 15. Oh, so okay. he stayed at home I mean, until then. Yeah, That's still really fucking young. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> But back in 15, you yeah. know, <laughs> it was, I was like, 15, time to be a man. Yeah, right. Time to go to war. <laughs> oh my gosh, I was like, what play am I going to be in? <laughs> um, so to mention all of her sim- siblings' names would take too long, and most of them don't really play a huge part in this. Yeah, some of them died really young, but like the ones that lived into adulthood, it was like, what, four sisters and three brothers? I think it was the other way around. Four brothers and three sisters. But still, to have like eight children make it to adulthood, that was... Mama's a fertile myrtle, bitch. She's a fertile myrtle, (laughs) and just that was like... Not always common. It wasn't. No, we talked wasn't, about so many women that have had miscarriage after miscarriage, and, and it wasn't guaranteed that your children would survive the first year of their life. Mm-hmm. So that she, they, this family had eight. They were very lucky. Yeah, yeah. very, 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 very lucky. So her education. If we're going to compare it to other women that we've talked about, uh, I would, I would, I would grade it a hard meh. <laughs> <laughs> It's very true. It's yeah. very true. Like compared to like Catherine of Aragon and Anne Boleyn. Yeah. Hello. Who like, who like were raised at like court and given like the best education money could buy. And they the were time. also taught like to speak a bunch of different languages because you maybe had to speak to the ambassador of yeah. France or speak to the king yeah. of Spain. And they, and they were like, well, Jane's gonna marry a knight you know so, like a best case maybe she's gonna marry a baron yeah or something so what's like that. the point so there's no reason to teach these girls how to speak other languages or to understand like different cultures or anything like yeah that. but don't get it twisted she did know how to read and write yeah and she did but not in latin yeah <laughs> okay touche touche <laughs> um she learned needlework which mm-hmm. was something that would have been very common for a social yeah it was woman like at the if time you were going to host people you were expected to like have like either a reading circle for like biblical readings or needlework circle yeah. for the ladies when they came over needlework circle yeah yes, yes. yes. <laughs> um some circle work um <laughs> it's kind of like circle jerk yes that's what I was... you that's didn't need to say it it was implied but there we go they even had to go there um <laughs> but yeah she also um was she would have learned some kind of music because women were expected to, like, 
know it a little bit, but she wasn't a necessarily talented musician. No. Um, but she did. She was a pretty good horse rider. Um, she loved yeah. to hunt. Yeah. So all in all, just kind of like a country education, like running a household, learn to sew, learn to hunt. So what did she look like, Katie? Well, we know the facts, um, but the aesthetics are up for debate. Mm -hmm. We know she was blonde with very light complexion and light eyes. And at the time, on paper, that's considered like the abs- the beauty the, standard. Yeah, the English beauty. The English the rose, as they would call oh, it. Like a, it was like a fair skin, fair hair. Um, quiet, demure woman. So she checks all these boxes, um, but we'll get it to it a little bit later. I don't know if we could necessarily um, describe her as beautiful. Okay, that's yeah. fair. No, it's fair. I mean, if yeah. you look up pictures, you're like, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, we'll get more into that later. But I, I um, on paper, she was the standard of beauty, but... Dot, dot, dot. Okay. okay, so there is some scandal. So If this happened, it's a huge fucking scandal. Yeah. So... It's still debated whether this actually happened or not, though. Okay, her eldest brother's name was Edward, and he was married to a lady named Catherine. So we don't know what really happened. This is all kind of just he said, she said bullshit, but it's still a juicy story, girl. Yes. So Catherine's father died in 1527, and she was supposed to inherit all this shit because her parents didn't have any sons. But instead, he added to his will that Catherine nor her children should inherit anything from his estate. Okay. That part, obviously, is definitely a fact because it's all written down and that's who you inherit your shit from because yeah. that's in his will. So that's all and like so, that. And so scandal, like the rumor mill started... What did just, Catherine do? What, they get, yeah. like, written out of the will. Oh my something god. Horrible. Scandal. And she ends up going into a nunnery, so even more like... Like, soon like, after he died, soon after the will came out and she realized she wasn't getting anything, she went into a nunnery. And it's like, married women didn't just become nuns. No. I mean, sometimes it would happen, like, whenever they... I mean, I guess it wasn't completely unheard of, or... But it was more like when your husband died. Yeah, it's like when your husband dies and you're like... And you're not wanting to get remarried. Exactly. Or something, you might go into a nunnery. But, so it was like, well, what the fuck happened that her dad wrote her, wrote her out of the will and then she joins a... Drama. And so, <laughs> the, the rumor that has survived to this day is that Catherine was having an affair with Edward and Jane's own father. Oh my god, this is like, oh my god. And Edward didn't believe that their children together were actually his, but they were basically his brothers. Girl, they, they this, were <laughs> this sounds like some Mori Povich shit. Like, oh! My, oh. my daddy's the father of my children. Yes. Like, my yes. children are actually my brothers. Can you <laughs> imagine if this is true? Again, we have no way to like back up that's just a rumor that survived to this day and we we and what's really sad about like all of this is that all we have on her life is just like rumors and a lot of rumors not not a lot written down yeah we don't really know a whole lot about her life until she showed up at court sometime between 1527 and 1532 she was in the service of Catherine of Aragon at the time. Yeah. Um, it's assumed that Jane probably served in some other capacity before becoming a lady in waiting to the queen. Because you don't just you don't just come from obscurity and become a lady in waiting to the queen. No. She probably she probably either my assumption is that she served probably in somebody else's household first, like a duchess or something. Oh, and moving on up. And then like the duchess was like, Well, I don't need her anymore, but I need to, I wanna find something for her to do because she's a really good Lady in waiting, or whatever. Hey, and then like promoted her up. Make it. That's my assumption. Yeah. But we do know at the time, whenever in by 1532, when Jane joined Catherine's household, like the the Anne Boleyn scandal was already in full force at this point. And Catherine was looking for ladies of wait in waiting who were going to be quiet (laughs) and not cause any scandal and not be flashy. So, well, I mean, can you blame Catherine at the same point being not. like, uh, I don't and want so, any drama. No, 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 no drama. Jane Seymour was like, well, I am quiet and certainly not flashy. Mm-hmm. And I do not want any more drama in my life. Um, I think I'd be a perfect candidate. And Catherine was like, you know what? I think you would too. You're hired. You're hired. <laughs> so um, something I'd never really thought about before doing this research, Anne and all of the other Henry VIII's mistresses were all noted to be chosen like for 
Like, for instance, you know how Anne Boleyn and caught Henry's eye when she was, like, in this play? Oh, yeah. They were very spectacle. And yeah. And she, she played, like, Perseverance or yeah. something. Like, she played a role. Jane was never asked to be in any of these pageants. Jane was never, mm. like, the lady at a dance, at, like, at a ball or whatever with the full card. What started her to kind of have this plain Jane persona? But I also wonder if it's because she was serving with... Catherine of Aragon and um, the king was spending more, there's basically two queens and two queens courts at this point Catherine's and Anne's and Henry was more camping out at the Anne camp yeah. so maybe she was never invited to be in a pageant because Catherine of Aragon wasn't just going to throw these pageants if the king's not even there yeah they you know, didn't she, have pageants yeah and her. she wasn't throwing balls by herself so yeah uh, just side note where did the name plain Jane come from because I feel like it should be Jane Seymour. I mean, that's what, every, that's what a lot of people call her. Like, that's kind of like a, a nickname. But, like, yeah. where did plain Jane come from? Do you think Maybe she originated? I yeah. I think it's, it's just OG. the words rhyme. <laughs> and we are a simple people. Okay, you being real. <laughs> <laughs> but it could be because she maybe she wasn't in these plays because she was a plain Jane, or maybe she just never got asked. Yeah. Nobody yeah. ever was like, hey, yo, you want to be in this play? This because she was because she was at the court of Catherine of Aragon, which was not a flashy. And yeah, she's yeah. super young, too, so she hasn't had like Mm-mm. a lot of life She's not experience. that young. She's not that young at this point. She's like 24. Yeah, but still that's... I mean, no, but by then, the, by then, those standards, no, that's not young. That's yeah, back old. back then, that was she's not young. She's a hag. She's an old hag. Well, I mean, she was starting to get worried that she was going to be. God, I would be ancient. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, at this time, um, Catherine lived at Richmond Palace, which was maybe about a mile and a half from where Anne Boleyn and Henry had their court at Greenwich Palace. But it's important to note that the first couple of years that Jane is at a lady in waiting, she's not seeing the king on a regular basis. No, he's not really visiting Richmond because, yeah. again, he's with he's not seeing Catherine of Aragon. Yeah, they had, he's with Anne Boleyn. They had ended their physical relationship ages ago. Yeah, so. Jane does have some connections at the court, though. Yeah, that would have you know helped her get a real job. Mm-hmm. Her brother Edward had been working at court for over a decade by the time Jane just rocks on up to the court. And he's working for this little guy uh, called Thomas Cromwell. Maybe you've heard of him. Maybe, maybe. But no, if you have listened to our other two Henry VIII's queens, you've definitely heard of Thomas Cromwell. He's um, Henry VIII's like, right-hand dude. So the fact that her brother is in service of the king's right-hand dude probably really helped her get her position that she was in. And then there's this other guy named Francis Bryan. He is second cousins to the Seymours, which means he was also second cousins to the Boleyns. Because they're all related. But he actually liked the Seymours. Oh. He had always taken like this special interest. In, like He probably had a hand in getting Edward the job with Thomas Cromwell. Yeah, and uh, Francis was pretty good buddies with the king, mm-hmm, too. Mm-hmm. So he probably put in a good word with somebody uh, you know, to get Edward and Jane their places in court. Totally. And he was like, okay... Look, Jane, you're 24. It's 16. It's the 16th century. You you're may, a hag. You may as well be 73. <laughs> you are too old to not be married. And so he starts. He's like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna solve this for you. And so he starts looking around for a husband for Jane. Yeah, because un, unmarried ladies at court. The only reason they're there are to find husbands. Okay, so not to be ugly, but really don't think Jane was this good-looking woman by today's standards or the standards of yesteryear. Yeah, because she was in her mid-20s and she hadn't had any even hints of proposals. But maybe that's because she's like super shy and she doesn't isn't really outgoing. But wasn't that supposed to be like the ideal wife at the time? Like a quiet and demure? Touche. And like if you compare it to Anne Boleyn, who her first few, few years at English court, she was having... Thomas Wyatt write poets about her, poems uh, about her, right, right. and then, you know, having dukes, like, going against their parents' wishes and proposing to her. But you did, like, we did say that her family had this horrible reputation, though, yeah. because of that whole scandal. Yeah, so, so maybe, but... Also, that plays into it. But her younger sister, Elizabeth, was already married. Uh, okay. Which makes me go, because, like, they're like, oh, well, maybe the Seymours didn't really have enough money for a dowry, and then it's like, well, then how did... It the... sounds like there's a lot of excuses It for sounds like she probably but... just wasn't considered to be a catch. Yeah. She's not from this 
she's not particularly good looking. She's not from a super connected family. So she just kept getting passed up. Uh, yeah, so we don't think she was particularly cute, but maybe she was really funny or something. So she's she's no Anne Boleyn, though, yeah. at this time. It's likely that they served together at court, though. They definitely knew funny each other. Thing. Yeah. Uh, there's no record of them, like, actually having met or being friends. They definitely would have met. I mean, there's no record of it, but they were both ladies-in-waiting at court. Yeah, there's no record, but they would have been at court at the same time. But there's nothing saying that they were friends or not, but I'm, I'm pretty sure they knew of each other and probably yeah. talked of many of times. Yeah, and they were, um, I believe, cordial to each other while they were both ladies in waiting. Yes. And, yeah, but while Jane was working for Catherine, she develops this um, real devotion to Catherine of Aragon. Yeah. She just views her as the perfect queen, pious, and stands up for what she believes in. And um, yeah, she's just like, she's she is Team Catherine 115%. Which, I mean, I can be down with. Yeah. And Team Catherine, come on now. She's a, good, she's a cool chick. Yeah. So Jane does actually have one short-lived first engagement. So remember Francis Bryan? So he arranges an engagement with a man named William Dormer. The engagement was short-lived and led to absolutely nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, William's parents were super not into it from the get-go, and they only agreed to it because Francis Bryan's close relationship with the king, and, you know, that might benefit me somehow, yeah. which, you know, entertaining the idea. Yes. But William was an only child, so his parents were like, look, if we had more kids, sure, we'd just, like, throw one of the guys away to appease Francis Bryan, but... We just have this one boy, so we got to make this shit count. <laughs> make it count. Later on, Jane got word that William was actually engaged to someone else. And there's no documentation on how she would have taken this. But how would you have taken that? Yeah, not good. It must have been, like, put, let's put ourselves in her shoes real quick. She's in her mid-20s. Her younger sister is has already been married for a minute. And she's here, an old maid, at the ripe old age of, what, 24? 24, 25. (laughs) The one and only man that's ever showed remote interest in her has now dumped her for a better prospect. I am not feeling good for Jane right now. (laughs) I'm I'm thinking she's mortified. Yeah. Depressed. Yeah. Feeling super bad about herself. How could you not? I mean, again, we don't know. Maybe this dormer guy was, like, a super dud and she was relieved, but... I have a feeling that it, it was not a happy time. Yeah, she's not feeling like she's on top of the world, yeah. girl. And to make things worse, her beloved mistress was undergoing the biggest disgrace. In Christendom. Yes. I mean, even today. <laughs> her husband was breaking from the Catholic Church just to divorce her. In case you haven't heard. <laughs> and once Henry VIII had broken from the church and declared his own marriage to Catherine invalid... <sighs> She was sent to fuck off to, like, ye old dusty castle (laughs) and had, like, her entire staff pretty much stripped from her. Yep. So Catherine is being physically forced away from her only living child, her daughter Mary, sent off to just just die in obscurity. And Separated from your child. Fucking depressing. So I imagine that while Jane was in Catherine's service... She would have seen this, like, absolute anguish that Catherine was in. And I think that stuck with Jane. Oh, absolutely. Like, you don't just... Like, because she I respected think, her so much. To be to be fair to Jane, I think everything that happens in this sequence of events stuck with Jane. Yeah. But <laughs> I, this think that, I think I this, um, witnessing this just anguish really... Anguish your child is being really separated from you. You're being banished away from Disgraced. your child, your family. Everybody hates you, blah, 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 blah. Like, awful. Yeah. And that was her girl. Like, yeah. So Catherine doesn't get to say like who in her staff gets to stay. Um, so Jane probably wanted to stay with Catherine, but at the same time, they're like, "Okay, we're slimming down her staff, so you got to stay here." She was like, "Cool, so I don't have to go away to this really far." I don't off- have to go to Yule Dusty <laughs> Castle. Yes. Yule Dusty and they're like, Castle. "No, we're sending you to the service of the new queen." Anne Boleyn. I just had a great merch idea. What? <laughs> Panties that say ye old dusty castle oh on the God. front. <laughs> <laughs> I just had a merch idea. Sorry. Coming to Etsy store. Queen's podcast Etsy store soon. <laughs> Panties ye old dusty castle. I love it. <laughs> Sorry. I genuinely oh, love it. I just literally had a little ding light bulb moment. <laughs> Anyway, so they were like, um, hey, you're going to go work for the new Queen Anne right now. And I feel like Jane probably was conflicted about it because I don't think she was Anne's number one fan because of what she saw happen to Catherine of Aragon. Yeah. But I think, I mean, for the last few years, 
she's been at a quiet court with no husband prospects. And drinking beer. <laughs> Possibly drinking beer, because we know that that's about the time that uh, Catherine and Aragon started enjoying her Welsh beer. Yeah, so lots of Jesus prayers, sewing, and beer. Yeah, which I think, I mean, I'm sure Jane likes, but I'm sure she was ready for a faster pace. Yeah, she yeah. wanted a real court life. Yeah. And now she's with Anne, she's attending all these balls and parties, and there's all these... It's handsome... just a completely different Yeah, atmosphere. there's all these handsome menses all around. All around. She's ready to go. She's ready to pounce. Oh. So in 1533, she's now a lady in waiting to Anne Boleyn. Um, it must have been weird to her, like kind of just having this completely different shift in lifestyle. Um, her actual job description, however, would have been mostly the same. You know, helping her get helping her get dressed, just helping her with whatever she needed. But I have to imagine that she resents Anne Boleyn. More than a little bit. Yeah, because she probably has a little bit of a bad taste in her mouth. And also, later on, um, the Spanish ambassador, Chapuis, wrote that Jane was of no quick wit, but may have some understanding. So I feel like, because just Anne Boleyn was so famous for her big fucking mouth and like how witty and quick mm-hmm. she was. And I feel like Anne probably felt like a deer in the headlights trying to keep up with that because she wasn't you raised Jane, to... Jane. I'm so sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jane probably felt like a deer in the headlights... What would the 16th century equivalent of headlights be? <laughs> Deer in the torchlight? Yes, in the torchlight. <laughs> Trying to keep up with just the witty banter because she wasn't raised that way and that's not something she experienced in her previous court life. Yeah. So she probably looked kind of dumb by comparison, which yeah. isn't fair. I don't think she was dumb. No, not at all. She just wasn't used to this. No, no. It wasn't her nature. <laughs> Absolutely not. She goes unnoticed for a for quite a few years. Yeah. She just kind of flies under the radar. So from 1533 to 1536, we don't really have any record of Jane at this time. And what she was up to besides yeah. just being a lady in waiting. Yeah, to Anne Boleyn, but there's no record of any sort of drama, any sort of... Suitors, unfortunately. Yeah, nothing that's really there. But here are a couple of things that happened while she was at court. So Anne's coronation... Mm-hmm. She would have walked behind her as a lady and a lady of honor at the coronation. She would have also been there for the birth of Anne's first child, Elizabeth. Maybe, Maybe you've, you've heard, heard of her. <laughs> and she would have been there during the birth. Like she probably, probably helped, yeah. you know, clean up and be part of the birth of, and get the towels or whatever. Yeah, grab, yeah. I think somebody once emailed us saying that like no unmarried ladies didn't actually attend the actual like labor. Because they didn't want to scare them off from getting married and having kids of their own. But well, that's she, fair. So if that's true, though, she still would have attended Anne during her, like, confinement or whatever. Yeah. yeah. She would have been there during the, that weird fucking 16th century confinement. Oh, we've, done, we've covered that before, ladies I and mean, gentlemen. I mean, if there was Netflix, I feel like confinement wouldn't be that bad. But there no. was no Netflix. <laughs> so what do you do? You just read the Bible and stare at the ceiling like yep, all day? Like, that sounds like Katie's hell. <laughs> oh my God. I would be so, I would have such cabin fever. Oh. <laughs> so Jane also would have, during this 1533 to 1536 time, her brother Edward got married. So For a second time. Again. He got married again. And he, she would have gone off and attended that wedding. Yeah. I wonder if their father attended that wedding. Drama. Drama. In 1535, Henry VIII's court went on summer progress. And this is a turning point in Jane's story. I think we've mentioned uh, the tradition of progress before in our other podcast. It's basically episode. just all of the <coughs> courtiers and the king and the queen and all their ladies in waiting and privy count, just like everybody just gets on their horses and leaves London. And it's, they do it for several reasons. One, so, the, the, the castle, the palace in London needs to be cleaned. <laughs> it's really nasty. It's really nasty. They don't it understand. It is a ye old dusty castle. <laughs> if, if by 1500s standards they thought it was dirty. That's got to be nasty. It, it, it must have smelled. Um, <laughs> and so they do that so that they can, you know, clean and replenish and everything. And they also do it so the king and queen can be seen. Because, um, you know, like people that... It's like a PR tour. Kind of. like because I mean, like nobody knows what you look like. They've never been around you. Yeah. So, so it's a way to just the peasants, the peasants can come out and see the Royal Progress yeah. drive by and wave and like a parade or something. Yeah. And because, you know, people that lived a day or two horse right away, if they're not 
like of the nobility, they never leave their town. Yeah, they're never going to see the king. Yeah, of so it was a way to be seen. So, and they would go from um, castle to castle of people in the nobility. So, you know, couch surfing. Ye old couch surfing. Ye old couch surfing. <laughs> we got to drop the ye old. It's getting, yeah. <laughs> it is getting ye old. <laughs> it was a huge honor for the royal court to come to your place. Of course it would be. And also it would be a huge expense. Oh my god. <laughs> the king came they, to your place. They could go bankrupt. There are stories yeah. of like people going bankrupt from having the court come and stay at their place in I some would progress. not bl- like I it's mean a lot of people to feed and the king is not known for his frugal tastes. No. Yeah. He he gets a little bit boozy. So, in 1535, the Seymours are asked to host um, a stay on the Royal Progress at Wolf Hall. And this is huge. Huge. This is is very huge. They were probably chosen because, uh, at the time, her brother Edward was now working for Thomas Cromwell, and Cromwell was really fond of Edward. Yeah, I think he saw a lot of promise in him, and I think Cromwell was really smart about... um, well, I'm going to promote the people that I think are going to be loyal to me. So the Seymours and Cromwell are kind of tight knit. Yeah. And so this is when all the romantic stories go about when Henry first met Jane. Or first noticed her, at least. Yeah. I'm sure they would have met before. It's certainly possible that this could have been when Henry first became interested in Jane because she was never front and center at Hampton Court. Yeah. And so she was... Um, more recognized here at her own home. Yeah, because her duty at home would have been to be the hostess and to, like, be... Well, no, actually, mm-hmm. whenever she... She was there as a lady-in-waiting to her queen still. So the ho- job of being the hostess would have been her mother's job. Oh, nice fact check, Katie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. She would have still had all of her regular duties for being lady-in-waiting, but... I mean, when it's your home, you're going to, you know, and your whole family's getting introduced to the king, you probably get pulled in a couple of times, you know? Yeah. So that's why some people don't think this is when their romance started, because she would have, it would have just been a regular day for her serving the queen. But it definitely is sometime, either at this time or within the next few months when the, when Henry noticed her. She caught the eye of the king. Mm-hmm. I believe that the Seymours, after having their successful hosting during Progress, were just, you know, in the king's favor at the time. Yeah, they were just noticed. Yeah. Like, he was like, you know, I've never really thought about the Seymour family before, but that was a really good stay. They showed me a good time. Um, yeah. I want to learn more about that. I want to see yeah. them around more. They, they yeah. had a nice party, so yeah. this is cool. Yeah, and we have no idea for sure. But what I think is that Cromwell noticed that Henry was starting to have a wandering eye away from Anne Boleyn. And Cromwell, like I said earlier, was really good about promoting people he thought they were going to be loyal to him. Mm-hmm. And he's like, okay, these Seymours already owe me for getting them on the royal progress list. So if I put one of the Seymour girls in front of the king, then they'll never turn against me if I get them that kind of favor. Well, I mean, it sounds like a likely argument. Yeah. So we don't know exactly when Henry officially had his hots for Jane, but it was sometime between September 1535 and before January 1536. See, Anne Boleyn, by that time, had had one girl and one miscarriage. And the king was not in love with her as he was he, before. He, he was still... I mean, he, there was definitely no talk of setting Anne aside at this point. But his eye was a wandering. It was a wandering. he was being a little bit of a creep, like TLC. Yes. And so when the Seymours and Cromwell put Jane in his line of vision, I don't think they were... They ever dreamed that they were trying to make her queen or anything. No, but a mistress at the time, if you were a mistress, you would have a lot of power, and you yeah. could get a lot of shit done. Yeah. Because bitches get shit done. And all of Henry's other, like, mistresses of note, um, like, Bessie Blount, like, after he was done with her, he gave her a husband. Yeah. He gave her a husband a pretty decent a, standing. Yeah, she had a nice castle, and she had a nice Yeah, life. she had a house, and she had, and so it was like, if, I mean, and then also, you know, you, you do favors for the family of your favorite mistress or whatever, too. Yeah. So, yeah, they were like, I think that at this point, Cromwell was like, let's put Jane in front of him and kind of coach her on how to get his attention. And I think this is where Jane gets her reputation. Yeah, because he was, like, telling, you know, they were coaching her, being, like, be the exact opposite of Anne Boleyn. Which, I mean, she's learning from her circumstances. She learns from Catherine of Aragon, and she's learning from Anne Boleyn and a lot oh, of yeah. her shit. Uh, and that's did... why I think she's, she is more clever than we give her. Agreed. Like, Agreed. she, she wasn't just like, a der, what? You know, she saw what was going on. She saw what happened to the other women at court. 
Um, and so whenever they were like, hey, you need to be the exact opposite of Anne Boleyn. Yeah, so... She was like, well, I already look exactly opposite of Anne Boleyn. So that works. So I'm just going to lean even harder into this quiet, demure attitude. Yeah, which, because Anne is, like, loud and obnoxious. She would never keep her big, sexy mouth shut. She would never keep her big, sexy mouth shut. And, and Jane would be like, OMG, I love being quiet I, and demure. <laughs> I love being quiet. It's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Anne was Protestant, and I don't think uh, at this time Jane would ever be, like, open like hey i'm catholic (laughs) because that she didn't want to get her head cut off yeah but she definitely sympathized with catholicism yeah so yeah it's Um, possible that it's possible that henry and her had this flirty little relationship at the time but nothing serious yes nothing Nothing, major yeah so anne boleyn gets pregnant again in 1535 (coughs) and then in early 1536 catherine of aragon passes away and again, we have no record of how Jane took Catherine's passing. But honestly, but again, we like, we kind of know. Because, put yourself in her shoes. Yeah, we've got context clues. <laughs> when when Catherine died, Anne and Henry wore yellow to I celebrate. Don't, I don't think Jane. I don't was think Jane happy about that. I don't think Jane was happy about that at all. She was not in a place of power to say, say anything. anything. Yeah, so we have no record. But I'm sure she was just like the fucking disrespect. But she wouldn't have put that on the king. She would have put that all on Anne. One honey. Because everybody in the country, if they were uh, upset about anything in the country, they put it on Anne. Because you didn't want to get killed. Yeah, you don't don't want to blame the king because you'll get killed. Yeah, yeah, you got to blame his wife. So I'm sure whenever she saw them in yellow on the day of Catherine of Aragon's death, she was just like fuck this bitch Mm -hmm. you know but Anne's triumph at the time and Jane's obscurity were both about to change the joust that changed the world (laughs) so Henry still thinks he's like big dick energy and but he's in this like mid to late 40s so he's bordering on fragile dick energy yeah and Um, he throws a joust and gets knocked to the ground and is out cold for two fucking hours long story short when he woke up, when he woke up, he was a changed man. For those that listen to our Agrippina the Younger episode, we see a lot of similarities in what happened with Caligula. Mm-hmm. Um, whenever he, he got sick, basically, and then came out of came it, out of it, and he's like, and then he's Caligula, crazy. Yeah. So basically, Anne had a miscarriage, and Henry bumped his head, and the British Caligula was born. Yes, yes. He he started the joust as a um, handsome, dashing. King and woke up as British Caligula. All aboard the crazy train. Yes. Woo, woo. So after Anne had her, or yeah, after Anne had her miscarriage, Henry zoned in on Jane hard. Oh yeah, tunnel vision is an understatement. Totally. There was a story that they portray in the Tudors on Showtime where Anne walks in on Jane sitting on Henry's lap. And sees her, like, grinding on that D. It's like, oh my god, I had a miscarriage because I'm Anne Boleyn. That is a fabrication. Yeah, the lady, a little bit of a stretch, guy. The lady that told that story, like, and got it in circulation wasn't even born yet at this time. Ooh. So it's almost certainly not real. But they are definitely flirting. And Henry's like, I'm moving in on this chick. And so he starts writing her letters and pursuing her. And, sending, and so one day... <laughs> Sorry, I had a little <laughs> chuckle with the story we're about to tell. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, one day, um, and this is like the first thing that's like Jane's first big recorded story, um, that this definitely happened. She receives a letter from Henry with um, a purse and money, and there's like money in the purse. So, there's this dude named Nicholas Carew, and Nikki C is um, fucking hates Anne Boleyn, and is like really close in the king's gang. So Nikki C runs up and he's like, yo, 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 baby girl. Um, <laughs> let me tell you how you need to handle this situation. Yeah. So Jane's official reaction when she got the gift of money was a bit much. <laughs> that, that is an understatement. Like this bitch throws herself to the ground. And pleads in front of the king's messengers that she's, I'm just a gentle woman, and all I have in this world is my honor. And she kisses the envelope and doesn't open it, and kisses the, the purse and doesn't open it, and gives it back, and says, um, the king can make me a gift of money when I've made an honorable marriage. Hint, hint. Hint, 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 hint. Bitch, marry me, ho. <laughs> so, 
we here at Queen's Podcast call that <laughs> bolinning. She bolined ho hard, guys. She bolined her little ass off. Because this is exactly what Anne did. But when, just like with Anne, when the king hears of Jane's response, he's like, Boner city. Boner alert. <laughs> woo, woo, woo. Boner he just, alert. He just likes when women turn him down. He likes the chase. Like, that's, yeah. He likes the chase. And yeah, I think this shows, I think this shows this. she wasn't as pious as everyone likes to pretend oh, like she was. Oh, no, she was not. I think it shows that she was down to play the game. She was like, this is my fucking moment in the sun. Yeah. I have been sitting on the sidelines for too long, and I'm ready to play the game. But do you think she may have regretted this decision? <laughs> How could she know what was going to happen I next? I know. I know. Spoiler alert. Yeah. It doesn't go so well. Yeah. But <laughs> at this moment, I think that she may look back in her life and be like, damn, I shouldn't have. Maybe okay. I should have just uh, been shouldn't. his mistress. She slept with him. <laughs> So Henry goes to Cromwell, and he's like, hey, I want to get to know this uh, Seymour girl, but she won't see me unless someone in her family is there to chaperone. It's like her uh, virginity belt. Yes. Like, <laughs> I need to make sure that- Her mom- chastity belt. Chastity belt, yes. that's what it is. Mommy and daddy are here to look after me. And Cromwell's like, well, her brother can have my rooms then. And y'all, this is a big fucking deal, because Cromwell's rooms are like conjoined to the king's room. Yeah, so Jane's brother is basically right next door to the king. Yeah, he has like constant access to the king now. And this is called moving on up. To the king's, king's room. Side. Yeah, to the king's side, exactly. <laughs> and so she's fully aware at this point that I'm making connections for my family. Yeah. I am moving on up. <laughs> and me. Plain Jane. They are going to owe me. I'm the one that he's after. So I think she was, um, a lot of people like to play her, like describe her as being a pawn here. I don't, I think she knew exactly what she was doing. Yeah. She had seen it. Well, Anne had done the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. And so she had seen this same thing happen before. So Except like, Anne Boleyn and Henry's thing went on for like seven years. So this is just going to be the pretty much the same story, but on fast forward. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Really. And everyone in court knew that the Seymours were on the up and up, including Anne Boleyn. And I think that Jane knew that Anne knew and very, very lightly rubbed it in Anne's face. What I'm getting at is that I think she knew more than people thought she did. And here's yeah. here's a story I like to use as an example. The story of the locket. So Henry gave Jane a locket with his picture in it, and she wore it loud and proud. And when Henry had been dating Anne, he had given her a locket as well with his portrait in it. Because, you know, he just basically took the same dating techniques that he used with yeah. Anne and just applied it to Jane. Yes. Uh, lame So Jane, who was... <laughs> Still a lady-in-waiting to Anne Boleyn at the time. She would wear this locket around court and play with it all the time. And open it up and look at his face and go, ah. he's so dreamy. And then, like, I mean... She knew. She fucking knew, like... You do not walk into the court of your employer twiddling a locket of their husband in yes. your hands. Like, this girl did not came to play. She, she came was, to slay. <laughs> she was just as catty and cunning as everyone else at the Tudor court. Yeah. And so Anne sees her playing with her locket like Jane wanted her to. And Anne's like, hey, what's that? And Jane acts all dumb, like, oh, um, nothing. So the story goes that Anne reaches across and rips the necklace off of Jane's neck and hurts her finger, which, highly possible, because I would do the same shit. Yes. (laughs) But I also think that's 100% what Jane wanted to happen. She wanted to make Anne lose her temper in front of everybody and look like this hothead that everyone always said she was. Oh my god, she's off her rocker. She's crazy. Anne is a witch. She's a witch. While making herself (laughs) look like the victim of an uh, evil queen. She knew the optics. Because mm-hmm. if she was as quiet and demure and pious as everyone says she was, she wouldn't have taken a locket from a married man. Boom. Mic drop. Mic drop. So, so that was just a ploy. And um, I mean, it worked because everyone was like, oh, Anne's losing her grip on reality. Yeah, everyone at court at this point knows that Anne's losing her grip and Henry's got this new boo thing over here. So um, everyone at court knew, yeah, knew she he had this new boo thing over here, as he said, which is lovely. Um, <laughs> Chapuis wrote of her. He wasn't, he wasn't impressed. 
at first. <laughs> yeah, at first when he wasn't persuaded by money. Yeah, um, and he wrote, um, she's of middle stature and no great beauty. She's not a woman of great wit, but she may have some understanding. It is said that she is proud and haughty, but she does have affection towards the Princess Mary. So he's like... He's not painting a great picture of her. On top of, like, her not being a great beauty, he's also saying that she's um, a snob. Yeah, but he doesn't paint anybody that's after Henry at this point. Or Henry's after them. Yeah. He doesn't paint anybody in a good light. But he does note, like, she does have affection for the Princess Mary. Yeah. So I'm not going to write her off just yet. I kind of want to fast forward through the arrest and trial of Anne Boleyn at this point because we've already covered it and you can listen to that episode. And also because it makes me sad. Yeah, but mainly because James is mostly MIA for it. But for continuity's sake, let's just do a quick quick recap. recap. Uh, Henry decides Anne is out, so he tells Cromwell to start an investigation. And at the same time, he's like, Jane Boo, I need you to get out of court for a while. Because he doesn't want anybody to associate Jane. He did the same thing with Anne. Yeah. Like, whenever Catherine of Aragon was on trial, like, for them to get a divorce. Manipulative. Like, they don't have anything to do with this. No, he's got one playbook. (laughs) He's got... And he's just doing the exact same things. Over and over and over. But y'all, at this time, I honestly do not think Jane Seymour knew that Anne Boleyn was going to have her head cut off. No. I mean, really, no. He, she thought, oh, he's just going to put her aside. Just like he did Catherine. Yeah. Same she, thing. Um, Nobody. Nobody expected that it was going to end up with, like, what, eight people getting executed? Like, bananas. Bananas. This, B- this court is bananas. B-A-N-A-N-A-S. B-A-N-A-N-A-S. This court is bananas. Okay, Katie. All right. So, um, yeah. So I think Jane is, yeah, like we said, just going to have Anne put aside. So she's just like, awesome. I'm going to head out. And she goes and hangs out at Nikki C's house for a little while while Henry does the dirty work in London. Literally dirty work. And um, it's sort of understood between the two of them that once Anne is put aside, that Henry's going to propose. But she didn't know put aside meant her head would be chopped off. Her head would be put aside from her body. (laughs) Yeah. So Jane is off chilling, chilling, chilling in the country, but we have no idea what her response was when she found out when the queen was sentenced to death. But if it was me, I would have been like, (laughs) what (laughs) the fuck? I have agreed to marry a man that just executed his wife. Yeah. I think, I think she had an aha moment as Oprah would say. And it was like, Oh, I need to learn from Anne and not be just like that because I could have my head copped off. She, I mean, I... Oh, that is like Nightmare City. Like, I would have <laughs> never... Be, I've never been in a relationship that started with us cheating because I, I feel like the whole time I would just be nervous of like, oh, well, he's going to cheat on me. I don't think I could ever then go on to be in a relationship with somebody that just cut <laughs> his ex's head off. <laughs> Oh because then I would be like, oh, what if he cuts my head off? <laughs> I mean, these are not easy things so to So I just comprehend. imagine she must have been like, but like, what can she do? Like, she's already telling the king, no, I'm not going to marry you now. After you signed up for this shit. And I mean, just... she's too deep in it. I, feel I like... can just imagine her getting the letter or somebody being like, hey, they chopped Anne Boleyn's head off and her being like, g g g be like, <laughs> The what now? Uh, oh, and her brother and also all these other guys. Because she uh, was serving at Anne's court when all these supposed, um, you know, like treasonous charges happened. She probably knew very well that Anne Boleyn was not fucking all these guys. Yeah. No, and so she, she knew. She, she knew, knew that Anne Boleyn was not fucking all these guys. So she was just like, fuck. I mean, we're assuming. We don't know. Maybe she was an absolute heartless bitch. And she was like, sweet. <laughs> this is awesome but it just doesn't seem to jive with the rest of her character no it doesn't I mean but, I think she was more manipulative than we give her credit for but I don't think she was a monster but can you imagine like being Jane and then Henry lobbing his ex-wife's head off and then one kneeling, day later n- kneeling on one knee one day later being like will you marry me and it's like fuck if I, I say no I'm dead if I say yes I'm dead. (laughs) I mean, first of all, she couldn't say no. Her family... Hashtag dead. There was no... She couldn't... In no possible scenario could she have said no. Her family would have disowned her. Her, like... So, yeah. Fine, I'll be queen. Please don't chop chop my head off. And then ten days later, in a private ceremony, they were married, like a Henry VIII would in his private little fucking ceremonies. And... If you're thinking that was a rush... 
So is ha- all of England. Like he tried, <laughs> he tried to actually not make it public for a while because um, it looks tacky. And it is tacky. It, lo- and- it looks like it. And but you know, word got out because no one could fucking keep a secret. Obviously not. Like especially with something so scandalous. And it looked horrible because it was like all these people who had been like saying, "Well, if the king wants to execute Anne Boleyn, she must actually be guilty." Are now being like, oh no, he he just wanted to get rid of her to marry this other chick. Yeah. It didn't look good. And some people thought it was because Jane was actually pregnant at the time. I fucking love this theory. You are subscribed. I, I don't know that I'm subscribed, but oh. I like but I like <laughs> like um Allison Weir has this uh fiction, like a novel about yeah. Jane Boleyn and she or Jane Boleyn. Um there is a Jane Boleyn, but that's not who we're talking about. About Jane Seymour. That she was pregnant. I mean, there's a lot of things that back it up. That she had slept with the king before they got married, and that she was pregnant when they got married. I think it makes great entertainment value, but I don't know if I believe that it definitely happened. It makes for an interesting theory, though. It makes her um, really interesting. But um, there's no evidence for this, really, that she was already pregnant by when they got married. But one, it would explain the quick marriage. Shotgun wedding. It would also explain why Henry wanted to marry this plain Jane who brought absolutely nothing to the table. Yep. She was... Because, you know, now that he's free of Anne Boleyn, he could have married somebody that was going to really bring, like, money or land or alliances. And... She's a nobody. I mean, Literally everybody in the country besides the people that were at court and knew her were like, wait, who? Who Who did... What's Wolf Hall? Who is, what is a Seymour? You know, like, what? So, say. Um, the Spanish ambassador Chapuis had also said when they got married, because he is a catty bitch and I'm here for it. <laughs> he said that, you know, there is no way that she could have been at the English court for all this all these years and remained a virgin. And he said when the king decides he wants to put this one aside too, he's not going to have any problem finding people to witness to that she had slept with other guys before him. Shepley is he, shady bitch. He is shady and I love him. I know. Anyway, she was announced as queen on June the 4th and everyone in England was like, who? What? who is oh. this? Queen that kinda you like, say? Kind of like when uh, hashtag poor baby Jane Jane Grey became queen. Yeah, it was like... kind of the same thing. Everyone's like, who? <laughs> <laughs> what now? <laughs> <laughs> she didn't actually receive a, a coronation, though. Mm. Catherine had been coronated along with Henry, and then Anne got one right away, and Jane never had one. The official reason is because the plague was like, Hopping, hopping in London. Like diseases, hopping, hopping. Yeah. <laughs> and they didn't want to risk, you know, catching the plague. Yeah. Um, but many people, more cynical people, say that he wasn't going to officially crown her until she had given him an heir and a spare. What a dickwad. Yeah. All right, day one. Henry's like, say, girl, you pregnant yet? Like, we can say Henry was in love with her until we're blue in the face, and I'm sure he was in his weird Caligula way. But I think he was really more in love with how fertile her family was. Yeah, he was like... It, Your mama's a fertile myrtle. Love you, girl. You like, got, yeah. literally just... There was no pretense. She was there to give him children. Yep. There was absolutely... He never pretended like that wasn't her main duty. Um, you know, he made it very clear from day one. And being that his previous queen just got her head lobbed off because she didn't have any sons. No pressure or anything. No pressure. Uh, no uh, pressure. Uh, <laughs> so Jane as a queen. Oh, and I guess, trying not to get her head cut yeah, off. Yeah, I guess we kind of, if she had been pregnant at the time of their marriage, she would have obviously had lost that baby. Yeah, it was a miscarriage. Yeah. Yes. But, um, so yeah, Jane is queen. Baby making aside. She decided, I'm going to have a different kind of queenship to Anne Boleyn in every way. She's just being her uh, opposite. I, she's like, I'm not going to get involved in politics. Not going to do it. Nope. I'm going to be the exact opposite of Anne. And Anne had been really into French fashion. So Jane was like, nope. I'm into English fashion. And like, so during Anne's reign, they wore the French hoods. Which, which is I, like a fascinator with like a fabulous hood. Yeah. And it's um kind of you see some of the hair. You can push it yeah, back a little bit. It's got a little bit and of... And it's... um I mean, I think all of the headwear that women had to wear back then was hideous. But this is like at least a little less hideous. 
And she was like, and so everybody has to wear an English gable. All my ladies have to wear English gables. So if you don't know what the fuck that means, Google it real quick. It looks like you have like a birdhouse on your head. Yeah. Like it is so fucking ugly. It's like this triangular shaped extravaganza. It's, it's disgusting. Yeah. I am down with the French hood. Yeah. <laughs> but she she just wanted to completely separate herself from anything Anne Boleyn. And so fashion was part of that. So Jane famously wanted to make amends between Henry and his daughter with Catherine of Aragon, uh, Princess Mary. Princess Mary was 20 at this point and just... You know, she was stubborn, just like her father. And her mother. And the king and her had been at odds with each other for fucking years. Yes. And Jane went to Henry and was like, okay, look, I think you should put Mary back into the line of succession. And maybe this would be a good PR stunt for you. He really needed some good PR. Yeah, after killing your ex-wife. And, you know, making everybody turn their back on their religion. (laughs) The the, the famous destroyer of religion. Wife killer. (laughs) And so I think Jane probably presented it like, um, you know, the people of the land will really love it. But I think she was really trying... I think now that she realized she had a little bit of power, she was like, I want to do right by Catherine. And, and she wanted to be like, dude, this is your fucking daughter. Yeah. And also, <laughs> this is your fucking daughter. And she's living off in Yield, Dusty Castle, and like, the people love her. And Henry blew Jane off and straight up told her, you should be worried about our children and not the kids I've had with other women. Because Henry, Henry I feel like Henry could give a shit about Jane's opinion. Fragile dick energy. I think he was looking at it like, I am not going to take any counsel from you until you've given me that air and that spare. But Jane was like a dog with a bone on Mary. We know she wrote a a letter to Mary and we don't know exactly what it said, but it was something like, hey, you had a shitty relationship with your last stepmom, but I, you know, don't want us to fight like uh, uh, they did, but I really want to get to know you. If you just bend a little to your dad's will, I bet you can get him to let you back at court and your life could be awesome again and we could be totally awesome. Because she probably met Mary at least once or twice while she was in the service of Catherine. Yeah. So they probably already at least, it's not like a complete stranger writing Mm. you a letter. It's like your mom's old maid like, old maid (laughs) your mom's previous maid of honor like, um, She's like what, 26 at the time? Yeah. (laughs) No, uh, a few months later Mary and Henry were reconciled and um, Mary was allowed to come back to court and treated how she deserved to be treated. And there is, while the letter from Jane does not survive, there's a letter from Mary that survives to James um, thanking her for the good advice. And people recognize this was Jane's doing. <laughs> yes, and it was amazing PR. Like, she was such a popular queen after that with... Um, just like the common people. Because, the, I mean, thinking about the religious, like, aspect. war yeah. at that time, like, she stepped outside of it and was like, hey, this is your daughter. It's above religion. Yeah. You and know, now, calm down. And now suddenly, Chapuy, um <laughs> went from being like, no great beauty, probably not a virgin, blah, 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 to being like, to calling her the Pacific. Because she, she was a pacifier. Like, she made, uh, she brought peace. And he, he, I don't, he wasn't wrong. She, that was a huge thing, getting Mary and Henry to reconcile. History's Eye pretty much gives Jane, like, full credit for All it. All the credit, yeah. yeah. She did, she did do good. And a lot her. of people viewed her as a peacekeeper, and maybe the only person that could keep the increasingly tyrannical king at, you know, at bay a little bit. So, uh, let's talk about the Pilgrimage of Grace. But just a little bit. Because that's the Patreon episode Yeah, the Patreon this. episode for this one is going to be on the Pilgrimage of Grace, so we're not going to dive into it too much. Um, we're not going to go that deep. We're going to go deeper in our Patreon episode. Mm, so, that's what she said. Basically, there was a huge uprising in the north uh, between England. because uh, Between England. Um, between in, England and England. And England. Yeah. Because there was dis- dissolution of the monasteries. And Henry's about to come down on these rebels super hardcore, y'all. So Jane decides in a public court to throw herself at the knees of King Henry 
in front of everybody and is like, please show mercy on your subjects, please. So this isn't as crazy as it sounds um, because us knowing how history went is like, why would you try to um, go against the king who is a crazy in front of everybody. But queens before this have all had subjects who have advised her to throw yourself in front of the king yeah. at this moment. So in like medieval time especially. So like if we think back to more like um, William the Conqueror or something like that. If he maybe was supposed to like show like a huge sign of wrath on some people... But, like, maybe he didn't actually want to do it. But he's like, but if I don't do it, I'm going to look like a fucking pussy. His advisors would go to his wife and be like, hey. It's a pardon. It's, it's, like, like, it's, a, like, they, it's a pardon. They would be like, hey, the king doesn't want to look like a, p- a pussy. So why don't you go and beg for mercy in front of everybody? And then he'll do it. He'll show mercy out of love for you. Yeah, make it at this and big so that spectacle. Was, so that was a really common thing. So she is just trying to play her part that she thinks the king wants her to play. But the thing is, she wasn't... Because uh, Catherine of Aragon did this to Henry several times. But she... Catherine of Aragon was raised at court. Catherine of Aragon knew how this game was played. Jane Seymour was trying to be a player in this game, but she didn't have any advisors. She didn't know that you're, the king's, um, you know, advisor was supposed to come up and tell her when to do this. Yeah. She thought queens just did it when, like, they were conscious. Fo- yeah. They were passionate. She didn't know what the fuck she was doing, and nobody was telling her what the fuck to do. And so, so she made a huge ass of herself in front of King Henry. Everybody. And so, basically, she's on her knees being like, please show mercy to the people in the north. And he is like, get up. And she's like, oh. And he reminds her of what happened to his last wife. <laughs> that gives me the shivers, girl. I the uh, thing, Okay, so here's the thing with Henry VIII. He's not looking for a co-ruler. He's not looking, like, no. Catherine of Aragon, they were coronated together. They were co-rulers. His mo- her mama was a strong ally, and he was trying to make an alliance. He's not and he looking was doing- for that. Nope. He's not looking for a wife to challenge him mentally. Like Anne Boleyn. Like Anne Boleyn did. That didn't end well. He's not looking for that. <laughs> he, is looking, he is looking for a wife to make him a son and to sit there and look pretty. So for her, Jane, to sit in front of the entire court with him, Henry... And challenge him like that. He's, he's like, you got me fucked up, girl. And so whenever he reminds her, like, hey, you remember what happened to my last queen that meddled in my affairs? Shut her the fuck up. I would. I would zip my mouth I, shut. I am shooketh just thinking about it. Like, he's no more... basically reminded her, I can have you executed at any moment. So, no more having fun, girl. Like, no more. <laughs> I don't need any more advice from you. Um, can, yeah, just, I'm terrified just thinking about it. So needless to say, she never tried to be part of politics again. But guess what? That's okay, because in 1537 of January, Jane is a pregger. Finally pregnant! And I say finally because it had been like eight months since they were married, and I do think that she started to worry about her not getting pregnant with him because maybe she would get her head cut off. Yeah, she was like, um, maybe starting to worry, like, oh, maybe I'm not <laughs> fertile. Unless, unless you buy into that she was pregnant when they got married and then had a miscarriage, because... Um, then that would kind of fit this timeline because it takes you a few months before you can get pregnant again after a miscarriage. But anyway, she's yeah. pregnant now and there are going to be celebrations in All London. throughout London. Bitch. The wine, the mead, everything is flowing. They had like the baby popping ceremonies where is this a boy or a girl? And they're like, it's a boy. Like they Except had, they didn't know. Because. Yeah, but well, they had <laughs> astrologers come out, which at the time was... Um, like, that was a big fucking deal. And the astrologers, of course, all were like, we definitely see a boy in the future. Because the <laughs> they say? don't want to get their head cut off. Yeah. And then Henry did what he always did when all his wives were pregnant. He started to sleep around. Yes. That's kind of his thing. <laughs> Unlike with Anne and Catherine, um, when they were pregnant, we kind of know who his main mistresses were. Um, but his anybody he would have fucked around with during Jane's pregnancy has not made the history books. But there are several stories of him, like, leaving their bedroom and going off and sneaking out to get that pee. Jane couldn't have been thrilled with this, but she wasn't about to make an ordeal about it. You no, saw bitch. Anne Boleyn made ordeals about it, and you saw what happened there. That big sexy mouth. That big sexy <laughs> mouth. 
again, she was like looking. Okay, well, I get. She's like, what would Catherine of Aragon do? And everything. And Catherine of Aragon quietly. WWCA. Yeah. WWCAD. <laughs> what would Catherine of Aragon do? And she's like, Catherine of Aragon would have just suffered in silence, and that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> um, but Jane, how, I mean, she was treated like. She was gonna break during her like she, during her pregnancy. She she had a T shirt that says "Stay calm and make babies." Stay, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Stay calm and make babies. She was not. I say she wasn't allowed to do anything strenuous, but I think she was just she didn't want to risk losing this baby either. So basically, for nine months, she just sat around and sewed with the shirt on that says "Stay, stay calm, calm and she's, 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 make babies." She sewed little tea cozies that said "Stay calm and make babies." <laughs> Um, so yeah, the next nine months are pretty uneventful for this story. And then in October, she goes into labor. And she is in labor for two days and three nights. Which sounds like hell. Jesus Christ, can you imagine? I would be like, get this spawn of a leech Satan out of me. I, I'm so happy we live in the future. <laughs> yes, yeah, C-sections are a thing now. I mean, they did C-sections back then, but you did not survive. Death. Some people, some people claim that she had a C-section, but no, she wouldn't have, she, because she did live, spoiler alert, a little bit longer, and if they had done a C-section, she would have been dead by the time they pulled the baby out, you know? So, two days, three nights later, on October 12th, 1537, England finally fucking has a prince of goddamn Wales. And Jane had a healthy baby boy, and the country Rejoice. It's like when England wins the soccer cup. The soccer cup? <laughs> soccer yes. cup. sports. Soccer sports cup. That's exactly what it's called. <laughs> yes. Yes. Are you going for the world cup there? Is that what you're trying to get? Or just soccer cup? Soccer Soccer sports, sports cup. Anyway. I'm sports and so hard. So yes. No. So <laughs> Prince Edwards is... Prince Edward is 100% the, the soccer sports cup. That Henry has been waiting for. And he's born on Edward's Day, so he is... St. Edward's Day? So he's Edward. So he's Edward. Yeah, he's born on Saint Ed- the Feast of St. Edward, so he is... They name him Edward, because... <laughs> I mean, you gotta remember, um, Henry was incredibly superstitious. Yeah. So he, he was, was like, well, this is a sign from God, and this is... We're gonna... God wants us to name it. Which is very Catholic of him. I know. <laughs> it's very, very Catholic of him. Anyway. But Jane survived uh, childbirth at this... Yeah, and it, she was expected to make a full recovery. The day after birth, I mean, she stayed in bed, but she, like, she saw people. Like, people came in. And, and they like, wrote letters to make sure that And, like, she, like, hosted out. people. Like, ambassadors came in and sat with her for 20 minutes here So and she there. may be a little bit sleepy, but she fine, girl. She, she, I'm sure she's fucking exhausted. But, yeah, <laughs> it, she was not. I just pushed a fucking watermelon out of my, well, yeah. It yeah. took me three days to do it. <laughs> yeah, I would be pissed. But I would not be as eloquent. Edward was christened. I don't think she attended the christening, but I think that, I don't think she was sick yet. I think that was just normal. I think mothers hadn't been churched yet, which is a disgusting thing. It's basically, <laughs> after you have your baby, you have to like basically stay in quarantine for a little bit, and then you go to mass and you're forgiven for your sin of filth. Of having a baby from your Yeah, it's your called husband. being churched. Yes. Because I am sickened. Isn't that disgusting? In not a positive so, way. So a lot. Are you ever sickened in a positive well, way? Well, you can be sickening, which is like a positive thing. Like anyway. I'm sickening. I look sickening. But this is like. Yeah, no, it's disgusting. Church. A lot of mothers didn't attend their children's uh, christenings because they hadn't been churched yet. Because they were filthy from. Don't take me to church. <laughs> anyway, Ugh. so Jane didn't attend that, and a lot of people say because she was so sick. But no, she wasn't sick yet. Um, she was just filthy from, you know, doing what having, everybody told her she needed to do. Having children. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so um, about a week goes by and she's like, she's fine. She's on top of the world. She's had like a baby son from she the She has game. done the, she had one job and she did it. But then about a weekend, girl, she gets the shits. She gets diarrhea. Diarrhea. And like, but like a serious, serious case of it. Explosive, and there are lots of theories about what caused Jane's um, downward spiral in health. But I think this mixed with, and this is gross, but like when you're in labor for that long, things down there are going to tear. Okay, so let's let's get scientific. And yeah. they're not going to be completely healed yet. And then you're having diarrhea on top of it, and then on top of it, the 16th century 
They don't know anything about Lack hygiene. Lack of medicine. <laughs> um, so things are getting into open sores. <laughs> that shouldn't be. <laughs> so that's one theory. <laughs> that's one theory of what happened. Another thing that, um, it's called childbed fever. A lot of women would... Oh, it's the placenta gets stuck Yeah, inside. because they did, cause like now we know that after you have the baby, you have to get all the afterbirth, afterbirth. out. And back then they didn't necessarily know that. So the placenta, like part of the placenta might still be up the, in there just rotting and causing infection. Oh my gosh, this sounds like... I would have diarrhea for weeks I just mean, based on this. So I mean, I get it. There's, there's several theories on what made her sick, but... Whatever it was childbirth. It, oh, yes. I mean, it, was, it would have not happened if she hadn't been in labor for a million days. But whatever caused it, Jane Seymour passed away two weeks after the birth of her son, Edward. So not only was the country in mourning, Henry VIII is in mourning. It's, a, it's the first time. Tommy Crommy is in mourning. Everybody's in mourning. But, like, I, it's so bizarre to think Henry had, spoiler alert for the future, he had six wives. And um, that's not much of a spoiler. Two of them he had executed. One, when she died, he wore fucking yellow. And the other two outlived him. This is his only wife out of six that he mourned when she died. And I don't, I think Henry was a little bit of a man child when it came to his emotions. And I um, a man child in general. I don't think <laughs> he knew how to process this or process anything. anything. <laughs> and the country didn't know what to do. Her funeral is the first queen's funeral to happen since Henry's mother, Elizabeth of York, died. Yeah, so they had to like a do, long time ago, like they 20 had to do, over twenty something years ago. They had to do like special research on it to what figure to do out for how, a queen's funeral. How to, like, they googled. What to do when mom dies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, literally. It was a huge to-do. It was, yes. It was a huge to-do. So Mary, his first daughter, was the chief mourner. Which and, is a thing. And, which is an actual job title. <laughs> and 28 of the ladies-in-waiting that followed her to her his funeral, all dressed in mourning. This and it was, was it was 28 women, each one, to signify a year of her life. So some people say it was 29 women, so she was 28 or 29 when she so died. So, symbolism. Yay. Yes. <laughs> Henry didn't attend the funeral. This is common, though. We've talked about this in other um, episodes where... So that Jane was the highest ranking person Yes. There. So, the king didn't show up because he didn't want to be bigger than she was. But also, I think he was in... I think he also didn't want his country to see him crying. He was in legitimate mourning, which we don't get a lot of instances where you're like, oh, Henry VIII, I feel sorry for him. He was expressing his fragile dick energy. Well, I mean, it's not fragile dick energy to mourn your wife when she dies. Which one? This one. <laughs> this one, Nathan. The one we've been talking about for the last hour and a half. But, sorry, we talked about three other ones. Yeah, true. <laughs> but he was actually, he was in super mourning. He wore black for three months. And I think also maybe he was feeling a little bit cursed because it's like, again, he was very superstitious. And now it's like, I finally get a son and the wife that gave it to me died. Dead. And maybe feeling a little bad for, you know, threatening to kill her in front of the court. Maybe he's getting a little bit of religious karma yeah. coming back at him right now. So let's talk legacy before we wrap this up. So Jane goes down as the super boring wife in history, but she's the one that Henry is buried next to. He's, she's the only one that he views as his legitimate wife. Out of all six of them. And it makes sense. Yeah. It makes sense. I honestly think that if she had been given the chance to be queen longer, once she gave him the sons, she could have done so much good. Because just in her like year that she was queen, she reconciled Henry and Mary. Mm -hmm. I bet she could have done so much reconciled good. Reconciled Anne and Elizabeth. Like, Well, Anne is dead. Um, you mean Henry and Elizabeth? Put up. Like, um, relationship. There's, I just feel like if she would have been given longer to rule, she would have been, first of all, we'd know more about her life. Yeah. And secondly, I think she could have done a lot of good. Even though I don't think she's as boring. No. I think she might be a little bit more manipulative than people think. I do think at her heart, though, she wanted to make the country a better place. She wanted to make Henry a better person. And I'm, I wish she would have been given the chance to do that. Yeah, cheers. Cheers to Jane.